Surely the Lord is good. You want more? You know, this morning, in my private devotion, as I realize I'm nearing retirement gracefully, <laughs> one of my prayer points this morning was, Father, raise up a new generation of men that will carry forward the work at Blessed Hope. And when I, when I look at my younger brothers, you know, belting it out, the Lord says to me, you, you can see what I'm doing already. I will gladly start retiring. <laughs> because, you know, you know like they say in Yoruba, if the bigger masquerade does not retire, the smaller masquerade will not find their voice. But today, we want to thank the Lord because in the work of the kingdom, there is work for the young and the old. And every one of us, whether you're a round peg or you're a square peg or you're just a straight peg, there is a hole in the kingdom that you are fitted for. And today we want to thank God because it's our men's day. And for all the men in the house, we rejoice with you. I, if you are a man and you are in the house, I celebrate you today. Because you know how it is. You know, men are not usually celebrated. You know, some of these children we have, before you know it, I'm speaking to men my age and upwards. Before you know it, the children will start calling their mom to start looking at the children. And if you are not careful, men, you will be left alone. You know, doing everything for yourself while the women are celebrated. They are the ones the children will buy the Ankaras and the laces and whatever. And many times we forget the men. But in the name of Jesus, you are in the house and you are a man. God will not forget you. Every labor that you have expended for your wife, for your children, for the extended family, the Lord will count it for righteousness. Amen. Hallelujah. The theme for us on this Amen's Day is as iron sharpens iron. And let me apologize to the ladies because the message for today is tailored for the men. That is not to say that as ladies, there won't be principles for you to go away with. There are definitely we. So when I'm speaking men, just trans, you know, translate it to yourself as a woman. As iron sharpens iron. And our scripture reading is from Proverbs 27, verse 17. Come, steam. Can we please reduce this a little bit? Proverbs 27, verse 17. The Bible says, As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. Let's bow our heads. Father, Lord, we have come to a time where we want you to speak to your church. And today, Lord, I pray that you may silence every distracting voice or spirit and let only the clear voice of the Holy Spirit be heard in the house. Lord, I ask for a fresh unction upon my head this afternoon. And I pray that you give me utterance, even as you use me as a vessel unto honor. Anoint the hairs of the hearers. May none hear to their perdition. But may we all be blessed by the word that you are about to speak. 
This is our prayer in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. The mayor of Philadelphia and his wife was sitting at a McDonald's restaurant one day. And then the mayor noticed his wife in deep conversation with a clown that was doing a birthday party in the restaurant. So when they were leaving, the mayor turned to his wife and asked, do you know that clown? And the wife responded, know him? I used to date him. You know, the mayor smiled in a very self-satisfied sort of way. And then he said to the wife, you could have been married to a clown. <laughs> but then the wife looked at him with a smile on her face, and she said, that's not the way I look at it. If I'd married him, he would have been the male. <laughs> Friends, have you ever thought about the people in your life that you know and about how they have influenced you. Who in your life keeps you sharp for God? If your answer is no one, then how do we find someone that we can rely on to help us along life's journey, along our spiritual journey? Someone to keep us sharp as Christians so that we can become the people that God wants us to be. That is why the wise man Solomon in the Proverbs 27, 17 that we just read says, As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. Have you ever tried to use a knife or a pair of scissors only to find out that they couldn't cut? I don't know if it's happened to you. And you agree, it's a, it's a bit frustrating. You, you've brought your meat back from you know, Hades or wherever you buy your meat from, and then you bring out the knife, and the knife just won't cut the meat. And the problem is not really that you throw the knife away. The solution is that you actually sharpen the knife. And our passage today has biblical principles, you know, that tells us how or what, you know, we need to be sharpened. So you know that Proverbs is a book about wise saying and how it is important to be wise. And it was written primarily to guide and instruct and influence Solomon's sons and indeed all of us today to live life fully in the Lord. So you will find in the book of Proverbs when you read it, general sayings of wisdom and truth to live with integrity, honesty, how to live morally and in relationship with your spouses, your children, your friends, neighbors, even your enemies or business associates, and of course, how to live right with God. So my question today is, what do we learn? What are the lessons for us about this wise saying in Proverbs 27, 17? What principles can we gain or glean from this passage about how we can become sharpened? Permit me this morning to share with us five lessons from this singular verse, you know, that Solomon has given to us. Lesson number one, we learn what is required for sharpening. So Solomon says, as iron sharpens iron. In other words, a dull knife cannot sharpen itself. Is someone with me this morning? You need an iron to sharpen an iron. And today I'm speaking especially to the men. You know, many of us men, we think that we are superman and that we do not need other men to survive. Have you ever had the saying before that boys don't cry? So they brought us up as men to think that we can go through life solo or to live in silos, needing no one around us. However, I want you to look carefully at the analogy before us today. No matter how sharp a knife is when you buy it, over time, that knife will get dull and it will lose its cutting edge. It is the same with us men. And in order to regain our sharpness, you need to be sharpened by others. 
So in Ecclesiastes 4, 9 to 10, you know, we always attribute this passage to marriage, but he, Solomon wasn't speaking about marriage. He says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But what to him that is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up? I'm speaking to the men today. If you fall without people close by you to lift you up, you are in trouble. The Bible calls this fellowship. Communing with one another. Coming alongside each other. We need each other. That's the truth. It's, it is essential for us and others in the sharpening process. Do you find that in life, even at times when you call for parties, you, you find more women there. You call for any social, you find more women there. Because the men is either we're working or we're doing one business or the other. And even when we are there at those functions, many times we can't even let our, our guard down. Many of us are still on our phones checking emails that will not disappear. We're always checking text messages. Even in church, we are busy trying to catch up with, you know, so that we are not losing in stock or losing in, you know, whatever it is we are trading in. But the truth is that whilst you are doing that, the women, they are having a good laugh and they are enjoying themselves to the maximum. So you go to the function, you are worked up. You get back home, you are still worked up. Friends, we need to know that we need people to sharpen us up. Iron sharpens iron as it comes into contact. I want you to know that there cannot be sharpening without a rubbing together or contact. So the process of contact influences each other and can sharpen the pieces of iron. However, in order to really sharpen and not to damage... Because you can, you can try to rob and you can damage. But in order not to damage, in order not to have a bad influence, you know, the, 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 the sharpening has to be done the right way. And it's the same with us too. We sharpen one another by influencing each other. But it, it is also important to influence one another in the right way. Don't forget... 1 Corinthians 15.33 says, Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. It doesn't matter how good you are. If those that you surround yourself with, if they, if they are bad folks, after a while, it starts to rub off on you. That is why the Bible calls each one of us as men to teach to encourage, to set an example, to explain and exhort and urge, to spur each other on towards love and good deeds. The Bible calls, also teaches us to be careful in the words we use, the examples we set, and what we are influencing ourselves towards. One thing for certain though is that we cannot sharpen one another by being indifferent or independent or incognito. Friends, you cannot keep to yourself and expect that you'll be sharpened in your home. You must mingle with others. You must have folks that you trust enough that you can let them into your lives. That is the only way you can get to be sharpened. But when we look at Solomon's proverb, we do not only learn what is required for sharpening. The Lesson number two is that we learn what it means to be sharpened. So just as a knife that is not sharp isn't productive or useful or ready to do the work that you want it to do or helpful, so to be sharpened as a man is to be ready for life. When you are sharpened, you are useful for those around you. You are helpful and productive in life and in society, and even in church, because you have been sharpened by others. It reflects the fullness of life. Being sharpened means, you know, uh, you know, when you are sharpened, it cuts across every area of your life, physical, emotional, social, even spiritual. Let me quickly break this down for us. So you need physical or social sharpening. 
Every man needs a friend that will motivate them. Perhaps you are growing pot belly. You need a friend that will say to your Remy, your stomach is becoming too big. Let's go to the gym together. You, you need physical and social sharpening. You know, maybe to join the gym. Maybe to pass an exam. You need a friend that will say, okay, I know you need it. I will do it with you. Let's do it together. You need friends who will make you feel better simply by being around you. You know, even though you, know, you, may, you may be married, but at times you need another man where you can just bond. You know, the moment you see yourself, you become like children again. You know, how you thoroughly enjoy yourself because, man, life is too short. You need friends who will bring out the best version of you. Friends who will give you the total freedom to be yourself. You know, you need a friend where you can misdive and you wouldn't even be thinking about it. You know, you know he can take it. You know, you need friends with whom you don't have to be on guard every time you are speaking with them. You know, we have so many people in our lives, when you are talking to them, you are calculating every word because you don't want to say something wrong. But you need physical and social sharpening. Someone that you can just say it as it is in your heart. Even if you have to go and say sorry later, you still say it. You need physical and social sharpening. But also you need, every man needs emotional sharpening. Friends prevent isolation and loneliness. And give you a chance to, for, uh, to offer needed companionship too. You know, recently this year, there was a story of two men within our church circle that we heard who died, and for five days, they were home and nobody discovered. Friends, it means that in those five days, they don't have someone close enough to them that after two days of trying to get them, will say, ah, I need to break the door and find out what is happening. Friends, as men, we are still emotional. The fact that we are men doesn't mean we are robots. We need emotional sharpening. Friend, people that will allow us not to be in loneliness. You know, I can guarantee there are few folks in my life, if I don't hear from them two or three days, in fact, I will start getting annoyed. Friends, we need people, you know, that you know, you know, they can share that loneliness. They can be your companion. Friends can also increase your sense of belonging and purpose. You know, many times we can be ostracized in this society. You need friends that will make you feel like you're part of my life. You're part of what I do. Friends can boost your happiness and reduce your stress. You know, you need friends where, you know, when you, after you've had a nice time together, you go back and all the burdens have been lifted from your shoulders. Have you noticed how spending time with someone that is negative or a downer really affects your emotion? and tend to drain you of joy and energy. This is what psychologists call emotional contagion, which simply means we absorb the feelings and emotions of those around us. So we need friends that will keep us in good mood all the time. You know, when you have friends like that, you find that many times when you deal with the, the rest of the people or the rest of the folks, you are able to deal with them with joy because you have, you have been sharpened emotionally. But we also, every man also need spiritual sharpening. Spiritual friends do not judge one another on worldly terms, but on God's terms. They do not fret over the little things that annoy or frustrate, but instead they focus on the big picture. Spiritual friends offer each other guidance and support, maybe even a firm challenge if one of the other is going off in an unhealthy or an unspiritual way. You know, you need friends that will pray with you. Friends, you know, that when you complain and say, oh, I'm having this issue, they will say, ah, let's pray about it. Or friends that will say, you know, when you have those temptations that we all do as men, friends that will say to you, ah, don't even think about it. You know, that's not what the scripture says. You need 
friends that will be able to pull you back. You know, friends that you can, because of the accountability you have to them. You know, you know that once you have told them, you have broken the power of that trial and that temptation. Every man needs an accountability partner. Someone you can open up to and say, you know, this is how I see. This is how I'm feeling. Do you know I was surprised one day when we went for a pastor's, you know, training. And one of the things they said to us there is that even as a pastor, you must have one person in your life that you talk to. Because members will come and they will tell you all of these things that can blow your mind. But you must have someone that you too must be able to talk to even though you will die. Because you will, you will be just be taken in and taken in and, and one day you just blow. Your mind will just blow like a fuse. You know, you, every man needs someone. You know, you need a spiritual, you know, a sharpness. Someone that will help you to balance everything. And do you also know that even though we walk for the Lord, that we all, all come to moments in our spiritual journey where you just feel down. And I can tell you, even with my 16 years of, in ministry, there are moments, there are some weeks where I just say to God, I'm not praying this week. I let him know ahead. I'll say, God, this week, I'm not praying. Because so and so and so is happening, and you act as if you don't see it. Friends, but in, it is those times that I need friends that will say to me, even though you don't feel like doing that, just like we were told, you know, at prayer meeting this week. That it is when you do not feel like praying that you really should pray. We all need, as men, we all need spiritual sharpening. Friends that will challenge us. But every man also need financial sharpening. And friends may give you a helping hand financially when you are stuck. Or friends may partner with you in business to fulfill your dreams. You know, I've said it here at Blessed Hope, and I, I want to say it again. You know, it is a shame that it is good enough for the people in the world, but it's not good enough for us as Christians. How dare you have folks that are not Christians, and they are partnering up in business, and they are doing big things. And in the church, we cannot even trust ourselves to do anything together. And I know I've shared some examples, but let me just remind you of, you know, two businesses, again, that you know very well that were started as partnership between good friends. Microsoft. Many of us, even now, we carry products that are Microsoft in our, in our hands. Our, many of our phones are still powered by their apps. Microsoft was founded in 1975 by childhood chums, Bill Gates and Paul Allen. Originally, the name of the company was spelled micro hyphen soft, but they dropped the hyphen and they never looked back. Both men eventually transitioned out of the day-to-day -day roles in the company, and they took position on the board of directors. But the company they founded continues to do just fine, reporting a net revenue of $72.4 billion for the fiscal year that ended June 30 last year, started by two childhood friends. And today, no matter the part of the world you are, every time you are using Microsoft, you are remembering a friendship, financial sharpening. What about Apple? And if I ask you today, how many of you have Apple products, even as we see it, Steve was near and Steve Jobs met through a mutual friend in 1970. And according to Wozniak's 20, 2006 autobiography, I was, he said, they just, we met and we just clicked. Remember, these are not Christians. We met and we just clicked. Six years later, they founded Apple Computer. Interestingly, there was a third friend who also founded, started Apple with them. His name was Ronald Wayne, but he left the company 12 days after it launched. 12 days, and imagine they bought back his shares for $800. 12 days after Apple started. However, Jobs and Wozniak stuck with it, and oh boy, did it pay off. The company went on to make the, the Mac, the iPod, the iPhone, the iPad, products that have revolutionized the technology marketplace. 
Apple posted revenue of 96.99 billion last year. Simply because two friends, non-Christian friends, just clicked and they came together. What generations after, people will still be speaking about financial sharpening. But friends, the third lesson we can learn from Solomon's proverb for us today, we learn what we become when we are sharpened. So Solomon says, as iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens or lifts up the countenance of his friend. You know that a knife that has been sharpened will shine more. Have you noticed? When you, sh when you, when you, when you sharpen your knife, it shines brighter. Because all the dullness has been rubbed off its surface. It's the same with us too. When we are sharpened, we shine better for the Lord. We allow other men to come and sharpen us so that we can become better. Our countenance can be lifted. Oh, no wonder the psalmist says in Psalms 133 verse 1, How good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. Note that specifically David says, When, who? when brothers live together in unity. And then you find Paul writing in Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. He says, And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Friend, we find that when we are sharpened, you know, we become people that will live a, a pleasant life. People that will live in unity with others. We find that when we are sharpened, we are able to love others. And we are able to be spurred on towards good deeds. The principle is clear. Just as iron sharpens iron, so we sharpen or influence each other so that we can be prepared or make glad or useful or productive and grow in every area of our life. But lesson number four that we can learn from Solomon's proverb, we learn what it takes to be sharpened. And I want to suggest to you that it takes intentionality to be sharpened. You know, just as the owner of a knife must purposely determine not to let his knife become dull. I don't know how many of us remember, those of us who grew up in Nigeria, and you go to the market, you see those butchers, uh, those butchers, those that sell meat in the, in the, in the, in the market, or at times, those, you know those that carry their their meat, you know, um, stock on, on those wooden things. And what do they do as they're walking? Be it is intentional. Because the last thing they want is to get to the next customer and they can't cut you the correct piece of meat. Friend, we too, every man in the house, we must be intentional about being sharpened. As iron has the purpose of sharpening iron, so we must be intentional about sharpening one another. We need to seek those who can sharpen us. And we also need to intentionally seek those that we can sharpen to. Let me say it one more time. You know, because many times it's easy to look for those that will sharpen you. But I want to suggest to you that you must also intentionally look for those that you can sharpen. Look again at Hebrews 10, 24 to 25. It says, and let us consider that we may spur ourselves, spur one another. You know, spurring means being intentional. You know, let us consider it. That is, think about it. Look for opportunities so that you, we can be spurred on. We can, so you, you must be intentional. But look at it as it continues. It says, spur one another to, towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together. It's, in, in other words, don't give up. Don't be discouraged. Be intentional. Be purposeful. Every time you have an opportunity to meet with people that can add value to your life, Take that opportunity. Seize the opportunity. You know people that, you know, they, they, can, they, can, they can benefit or impact you. Look for the opportunity so that you can be sharpened. There must be intentionality if we are 
to be sharpened. You know, then Paul again writing in 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, But we all, with uncovered face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image. For it says, are we all with our converse faces beholding? The, 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 the attempt to behold means you are purposely, you know, focusing, you know, on that thing. You are intentional about focusing. And it says, beholding as in the glass, the glory of God. Do you know that you cannot even be a Christian without intentionality? You must be intentional to focus on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. There must be intentionality if we are to be sharpened. Intention also identifies our true purpose. What is our intention in sharpening another person? The intention, according to scripture, is to help the other person become complete and ready in every area of their life. But lesson number five that we can learn from Paul's, from Solomon's Proverbs. We can learn who we need to be sharpened. Solomon says, as iron sharpens iron. In other words, you need a metal of the same or stronger strength to properly sharpen a metal. Do I need to say it again? So you cannot sharpen steel using an iron. Every man, are you with me? Because steel is a stronger and tougher metal. Many of us know that tungsten is the strongest metal. You cannot sharpen tungsten using steel. You cannot sharpen steel using iron. In other words, you cannot be sharpened by those that you are better off. So if everybody within your school sphere of influence are those you are better off, you will never be sharpened. For you need a metal of the same tenacity or even stronger to sharpen you. So someone says that if you want to sow with eagles, you have to stop feeding with chickens. Men, you cannot be surrounded by drunkards or foul-mouthed people People that are going nowhere and you think that you will be sharpened. What will happen is that they will be drawing from you every time. They will draw and draw until there is nothing to draw again. And because you are not being sharpened, you will get dull. They will get sharpened until they become like you. And then all of you will you get dull together. We learn who we need to be sharpened. I want to ask every man in the house today, do you have someone you go to for advice? What about someone that, who seeks your advice? I need you to know that the idea of having someone that will pour into you and someone that you will pour into is a very biblical idea. Can I suggest to every man in the house today, that every Christian man, you need four men in your life. You need four men in your life. And I want to quickly break this down for us today. You need a Paul. You need a Jonathan or Barnabas. You need a Timothy. And every man needs Jesus. You need four men in your life. If you are in the house today and you are a man and you don't have these four men in your life, when we leave this place, start making application to get these four men. You must have these four men in your life if you are to live a life of impact. You need a Paul, an older person, willing to invest in your life. Someone who has been down the road that have experience and they are willing to share their life's experiences and their life's lesson that they have learned with you and the experiences that have shaped their lives. 
You need an older and more matured friend that will be able to pour into you. An older person to spend time with you and show you some of the ropes so that you do not end up making the same mistakes that they made. You need a mentor. Every man in the house, you need someone older that you can tap from. And let me also say to us that many times when I say older, it doesn't mean that chronologically that they are older than you. For there are some younger men that are much older emotionally and psychologically than many 70-year-olds. But you need a Paul. You know, one of People who are close to me, you know, one of the things in my life is I learn from people's experience. I don't want to fall where you are falling. When I've seen you fall, what's the point? You need a Paul, someone that can say to you, don't do this though, because if you do it, you will end up this way. I remember I said to one of my younger brothers in the house years back, we were having an argument. Then I said to him, I said, look, even if I sit down, and you climb the tree, I will still see farther and better than you. See, if you use glasses, no matter the magnification, you cannot see more than some experienced old man. You need a Paul. Every man needs a Paul. But not just a Paul. You need a Jonathan or a Barnabas, a soul brother, who loves you where you are? Who accepts you for who you are? Who encourages you to become the person that you can become? Someone that will say to you, you can do better than this. That will love you in your failure. Be happy when you are happy. Be sad when you are sad. People seem to change for the better when they have a Jonathan or a Barnabas in their life. Friends that will bring encouragement when life is so dim and dark. Men, we need to surround ourselves with such friends because we become that which we are surrounded by. You can say, I do not drink. And you keep going to beer parlor or here they call it pubs. And you keep going to pubs because all your friends are pub goers. One day, one day, when you've watched them and watched them and watched them, one day you will just find out. It might just be just a sip. I just say, ah, taste it now. You say, you say you don't drink. Have you ever tasted it? You just taste it. You need a Jonathan, someone that will be happy even when you are making it better than you they are. Do you know that many of us, we are only happy with people up to the point of our own success? That is why you find many black men. When you have a business and somebody and you are making it, you will never show the other person how you've made it. Because you don't, even though you say you like them, you don't want them to be more successful than you. So you peg their success. But you need a Jonathan that will say to you, even though the crown belongs to me, but you can have it, and I will be your assistant. You need a friend, every man in the house. You need a friend, someone that will be loyal to you even though the heaven may fall, that will go the walk with you. So you need a Paul. You need a Timothy. Uh, you need a Jonathan, a friend. But you also need a Timothy. You need a younger person who looks up to you for instruction, for guidance, for care. Someone to whom you yourself, you can pour out yourself. Someone you will be mindful not to let down or disappoint. You know, one of my prayers many, many times when I'm praying about my Christian work, I'm saying, God, please don't let me mess up so that I will not disappoint the huge cloud of witnesses around me. Because if I know if my faith will fail, she'll fail today. So many people's fail, faith around me will fail. You need a Timothy so that every time you are thinking about your own weaknesses, you are saying, I can't mess up because of so and so. 
Someone that you are mindful about. Someone that will make you mindful about your conduct and your walk with God because you want to be a good example unto them. You need a Timothy in your life. And I want you to know many times, you know, we do not talk about having the benefits of Timothy because having a Timothy means you need a mentee in your life. But many times we talk about the benefits of having a mentor, but we do not talk about the benefits of having a mentee. You know, permit me to quickly share with you four things that having a Timothy in your life can do for you. Oh, when you have a Timothy, a Timothy will help you to cultivate your leadership skills, you know, in a way that you've never experienced. A Timothy will help you to develop patience. A Timothy will help you to develop problem-solving skills because they keep coming to you, pouring out their problem, and you must be sharp and think of how to resolve it for them. You need a Timothy because they will help you to have emotional intelligence and emotional maturity. You know, when, when you want to think about, you know, your own flimsy things, when they come, when your Timothy comes to you, you know, I cannot afford to be childish, you know, because they are relying on you for maturity. So the more you pour out into your Timothy, the more you are cultivating your leadership skills. Can I suggest to men in the house that perhaps the reason you do not have enough impact right now is because you have no Timothy in your life. But the Timothy will also help you to gain new perspective. You know, even when you know everything there is to know about God and the Christian faith, having a Timothy can help you to see some things from another person or a younger person's perspective. A Timothy will give you a fresh perspective, which can help to change some of your stale routines and allow you to see things in a new light. And when you have a Timothy, they're always bringing their new ideas. Oh, I think like this. This is what the way I see it. So every time you have to question your own rationale too and think about, you know, and be open to those new ideas that the new uh, that the Timothy is bringing. So a Timothy will help you to gain new perspective. But not only that, you know, a Timothy can help you to can strengthen your knowledge, you know, through your mentorship. You can impart your Timothy with the wisdom that you have learned from your walk with God. Teaching your Timothy will allow you to pay it forward, strengthening your own knowledge in the process. For those of us who are, who are teachers, you find that the more you teach a subject, the better you know the subject. And that is why you need a Timothy, because the more you talk to your Timothy, the better you are getting. You are, as you pour out yourself into your Timothy, you, your whole knowledge about life and about things is getting stronger. So a Timothy will strengthen your knowledge. But lastly also, a Timothy will, can help you to make a difference. You know, friends, it feels good to help someone else. And having a Timothy in your life gives you a chance to make a real difference in the life of a younger person or a younger Christian. You need a mentee. You need someone that you can disciple in Christ. You, every one of us as men, we have been called as fishers of men. We've been called to be our brother's keeper. To look for someone that you too can, you know, they can say, oh, he helped me along life's journey. You need a Timothy. So every man needs a Paul. Every man needs a Jonathan or a Barnabas. Every man needs a Timothy. But lastly, every man needs Jesus. I want to submit to you today that every man needs Jesus in his life. Every man needs the Savior, the one who forgives us when we mess up, the one who overlooks our flaws. We need Jesus, the one who presents us faultless before the throne of grace and mercy with exceeding joy. We need Jesus, the friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Yes, every man, you and I, we need Jesus. Yes, we need Jesus, the weak man's strength. Jesus, the sinful man's savior. 
Jesus, the corrupt man's righteousness. Jesus, the quiet man's voice. Jesus, the lonely man's friend. Jesus, the failing man's success. Jesus, the compromised man's protection. Jesus, the leading man's leader. Jesus, the forsaken man's reconciler. Jesus, the broken man's mender. Jesus, the sick man's healer. Jesus, the frustrated man's satisfier or satisfaction. Jesus, the condemned man's advocate. We need Jesus, the successful man's superior. Friend, we all need Jesus. If you're in the man, if you're a man and you're in the house today, I want to submit to you that you need Jesus. You not only need Paul, not only do you need Jonathan or Barnabas, not only do you need Timothy, but you need Jesus. In conclusion, Stu Weber writes of his experience as, at U.S. Army Ranger Training School. You know, he wrote of this experience as they were running in full field uniform. Loaded packs, helmets, book, boots, rifles, all the walks, 70 pounds every man was carried. And as usual, the word was, you go out together, you stick together, and you come home together. So miles they ran, then more miles, and miles after. Over the hills, through the brush and the pine, they ran. And somewhere along the way, through a fog of pain, thirst, and fatigue, Weber realized that something was wrong. Because two rows ahead of him, one of the guys was getting out of sync. Oh, a big redhead named Sanderson. His legs were pumping, but he was out of step with the rest. Then his head began to roll from side to side. The guy was close to losing it. Without missing a step, the ranger on Sanderson's right reached over and took the man's rifle from him. Now, one of the rangers was packing two weapons to help Sanderson make it to the finish line. And he, he was packing his own rifle now and Sanderson's rifle. So the big redhead did better for a while. The platoon kept moving on. But when his head began to sway again, this time, the ranger on the left reached over, removed Sanderson's helmet, tucked it under his own arm, and they continued to run. Her system, go, boots, thundered along the trail. Sanderson was hurting. He was buckling and he was going down. But two soldiers behind him lifted the pack off his back, each taking a, a, a shoulder strap in his field hand. Oh, Sanderson gathered his strength, squared his shoulders, and the platoon continued on all the way to the finish line. Friends, they left together, and they finished together. Blessed hope, man, the truth is, life gets heavy sometimes. The road stretches on and on. We give it a shot. We stumble. We find our rhythm once again. The road of responsibility as men bites into our shoulders and the race wears us down. We feel our knees begin to buckle and we fear falling short of, of the finish line. We need friends and brothers to help us along, to bear the load and sharpen us when we become dull. Friends, this is not a place or time to allow pride to set in. Someone this morning is like Sanderson. Oh, there is a man in the house that feels like Sanderson today. You are going down unless you get help. Everyone needs help once in a while. Friends, men, let me say it one more time. Every man needs help once in a while. Jesus wants to help you. And in fact, when you can't go another step, Jesus will carry you. Oh, and Jesus can.
can also use you and I to help others as well. How are you helping make a positive difference in someone's life even now? Men, you can, and so can I. This morning, where are you within the race of life? Do you have a battle body helping you along the way? Do you have a battle body keeping you sharp as iron, sharpens another iron? Or have you found yourself this morning feeling a little bit dull? This morning, men of Blessed Oak Church, will you stand with me this Sabbath? Will you stand as we pray together for the Christian friendship that we all need? Will you stand as we wait on God so that we get resharpened just as iron sharpens iron? Will you stand with me as we pray this morning? Father divine, we stand as men of and at Blessed Hope Church this morning. We stand because we realize that we cannot make it on our own. We cannot sharpen ourselves. We need other men in our lives that will sharpen us. But Father Lord, many times to find the right men takes wisdom it takes insight to find godly men that will stand with us through our life's battle father this morning we ask that you help us and bring into our lives other men that will encourage us into your kingdom Bring into our lives men that will bear financial burdens when we need it. Men that will lift our countenance emotionally. Men that, will, that we can relate with socially. Father Lord, help us. That in our moments of need, when we fall, help us not to be alone. But that we may have others that will lift us up. Lord, as men, this is our prayer today. In the mighty name of Jesus, we are praying. Amen.